And um, at the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games in Paris, if you watch some of that like I did, you're thinking, what in the world is going on with this world? This world's lost. I just thought about parents that are sitting there on the couch and they've got an eight or nine year old. This is the first Olympics that they can recall or even be plugged into or even kind of watch what's going on and watch the opening ceremony and the mockery of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Last Supper. And, you know, some parents having to explain that to their kid who watched that on national television. And uh, if for Christians, it's an opportunity for them to talk about how lost the world is and how lost the culture is and all these things. So it's a talking point, I'm sure. Um, uh, the outcry against that in here in the United States has been strong. Well, let me just tell you something, though. In Paris, France, that's a Muslim place, a Muslim. Listen, Europe is full of Muslims. It is overtaking Christianity and has for some time now. But I'll tell you this. They'll make fun of Jesus and his church. They won't make fun of the Muslims lest they get terrorized or they get killed or all these things. We as Christians don't do those things, amen? We don't retaliate that way. We don't bomb people when people disagree with us or we don't terrorize people. So maybe that's why they picked on the church, made light of Jesus Christ. Uh, questions come up. Someone asked me, uh, you know, am I going to like boycott the Olympics? Listen, it has nothing to do with our athletes and what they prepared to do. So I'll probably watch some Olympics, watch our athletes compete like normal. They didn't ask for that. They didn't plan that. Shame on Paris, France, and shame on them for whoever put that forth for their representation. They need to be prayed for. They will be judged. Let me tell you something, and this is a sermon inside the sermon maybe, but, you know, cities and nations, they are judged in the here and now. We as individuals will stand before the Lord one day and if we're saved, we'll stand there at the judgment seat of Christ. A lost person's going to stand there at the great white throne judgment. But cities and nations, they are judged in the here and now. And so even some of the things that we've faced in our country's history, some of that perhaps is due to us being judged as Americans through some of the things we've been part of. But I'll tell you this, God will not be mocked. He saw this happen. And... Um, you know, people want you to comment on that, and they'll say, are you going to boycott the Olympics? Now, personally, I'm not boycotting the Olympics. I'm going to watch some of our athletes do what they do. I'm not watching synchronized swimming, mind you. I'm not watching some events. I'm not sure if I know what that is, but, but I tell you what, I'm like you, though. I'm praying, and let's pray, for, um, let's pray for the lostness that's out there, that people would come to faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray before we get into this text and head in a different direction. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, for cities like Paris, France, and leaders that put forth that type of uh, horrible display on national television. Um, they called it art, and Lord, you call it an abomination what took place there. God, I just pray that, um, that Christians across the globe that witnessed that, that perhaps would talk to their children about it and help them understand that this lost and dying world doesn't love their God. And Lord, I pray that they would use that as a point of praying for people that are that lost to do such a thing um, lord we pray for um, uh, our country during this time in an election year um, we're not without problems here in this united states of america lord we pray for um, unity but lord i don't think that's going to happen without people really turning toward the one person that can unify them and that is you lord jesus so lord we pray for many people that do need the Lord to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, whether it be here in uh, Tennessee or these United States or Paris, France. Lord, may your church go out with the gospel and may your witness be strong. Lord, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for your presence here today. Lord, help us hear your voice as we read this text in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Peter chapter 1. That was all preliminary. That's not in my sermon time. Amen. Can I get a witness? Amen. Um, today we continue to uh, carry on in our series. We began last week talking about spiritual addition. And if you remember last week, we were in 2 Peter chapter 1, and we talked about the word diligent, and we talked about it a couple of different times. One of those, Peter said that we need to make sure, we need to be diligent to make sure that we are saved, that we are the part of the elect, that we've been saved, that we need to be diligent to make sure, we need to study our soul and 
examine ourselves to make sure we're in the faith. So we need to be diligent to do that. And if we're diligent to do that, then we need to be diligent to, to add to our, our faith all of these things that we're talking about here. And certainly today we get into this, that there are more things that God wants to add to your faith, that he wants you and I to grow. And by the way, healthy things do grow. And so God desires for you to grow. We covered that ground last week. And uh, today I hope that you have said in your heart that, Lord, I want, for, Lord, for my life and my spiritual life, I want whatever you want. That's the prayer that we should be praying. And so today here we're going to be in verses 5 through 11. And we pick up in verse number 5 where, where again, Peter's talking about these people being saved and walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. If they know him, then he picks up in verse 5 and says, also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Look at verse 8. He says, For if these things are yours and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more dil diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when we take a look at this list here, beginning in verse number 5, we see a list of things that Peter is saying that you and I need to add to our faith. And what we need to understand is that when a person gets saved, that these things aren't going to be added by default. That uh, because we're saved, all these things are just going to be added. You and I have got to show interest in these things. You and I have got to basically, listen, it comes down to us submitting to the Holy Spirit allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us and us follow His lead, follow the Word of God's direction, and, and be willing to receive whatever it is that God wants us to do. However He wants to change our lives, the things He wants to add, you and I need to be uh, open to that, and we need to ask the Lord for those things and ask Him to help us grow. Um, but we have this list here beginning in verse number 5. Now, this list kind of reminds me of a, of a shopping list or a grocery list that continually grows. You know what I'm talking about. You've got a few things you needed to get at the store. And by the time you leave the house and get to the parking lot and get from the parking lot into the store, the list grows. You know what I mean? It really grows if Nikki takes me along with her. Amen. And listen, if I go grocery shopping with Nikki, that list gets very long, very quick. And for the men in the room that just judge me for going grocery shopping with my wife, let me just tell you something. You want to work on your relationship, go grocery shopping with your wife every now and then. Amen. This sermon just went flat right then. How many of you men, listen, I don't want, listen, I have been behind you men that have never been grocery shopping in your life, and somehow your wife's gone on some kind of trip, uh, and you're there by yourself, and you're having to buy things. You are pitiful in the line, you know what I mean? I'm watching it, I'm like, the guy don't even know what he's doing. Well, listen, Nikki's trained me up a little bit, amen? Listen, I also go grocery shopping with Nikki because here's the thing. She's got a list of necessities in her mind. I've got a list in my mind that's on my own, amen? And so she's like, well, we're going to get these few things. And I'm like, well, we need Jesus, you know what I'm saying? We need little Debbies, and uh, we need some ice cream sandwiches, you know what I mean? Those, not the little ones, the big ones, I mean the real ones. And, and so I'm always, she goes there thinking, I'm going to get a few things, I'll add a few more things. She goes in thinking, we need the little, maybe the little basket that you carry. I'm like, no, we need the cart. We need the cart because the list is going to grow. Well, I look here at what Peter has given us here. Uh, there's a list here. It's, it's, it's more than a grocery list. This stuff is more important than the Cheez-Its. This is a grocery list here, spiritually speaking, that, that you and I, when we're walking down the aisles of this life, spiritually speaking, there's some things that God wants you to embrace, and there's some things he wants to develop in your life, and there's some characteristics that Jesus has that he wants you and I to have and so we begin this list, we'll talk about just a few of these today, and it begins with virtue, and we see that in verse number 5. He says, add to your faith virtue. Now, let's look at a definition of the word virtue in the English. And by the way, the English language is so insufficient when you start looking at uh, or comparing it to the original text. If you and I look at a, re a conventional definition of, 
a virtue, it's moral excellence, it's good qualities. Uh, we would say it's perhaps a high standard. Someone's got virtue, has a high standard. Another um, definition is it's ha- someone with virtue has inherent power, purity, fortitude, which is courage. There's some of the words that are used to describe this word virtue. So the question is, what is Peter talking about in verse number 5? And let me tell you, this is when a good study Bible comes in handy, or a strong concordance, where you and I can take a look at the original text and see, you know, virtue could mean all these things. What does it mean? What is Peter saying? What did he say in the original language? What was said there? And when you take a look at that, he's, listen, he's not talking about power. Some would say it's some type of inherent power. In fact, um, Luke chapter 8, don't turn there, but in Luke chapter 8, We have the woman with the flow of blood that is working through the crowd and she sees Jesus and she comes up behind him and she touches the hem of his garment and that's in Luke chapter 8. And the scripture says she's healed. Jesus turns around and looks at her and Jesus perceives that virtue has left him. That's inherent power. The power to heal her had left his body and healed that woman there in Luke chapter 8. And that's, listen, when you read it in English, it says virtue. If you've got a KJV Bible, it says virtue. It doesn't say uh, inherent power. Dunamis is really the word there, but it says virtue in the English. So is that what Peter's talking about here? And the answer is no. What Peter's talking about here in verse number 5, he's talking about fortitude or really talking about courage. Peter's saying that we need to add courage to our faith. And this is how he, lead, he leads out of the gate with this in verse number 5. He does. Now, for the early church that he's writing to, they're going to need courage. For the early church that is being persecuted and the heat's being turned up in the kitchen, they're going to need all the courage they can stand. Um, Listen, what they're doing, putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, is not popular. It's not popular with the Jewish community. It's not popular with Rome at all. It's not popular with anybody but Jesus that they put their faith in him. And so... So they're going to need courage as they've stepped out and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today, listen, we need to add courage to our faith. You and I need courage to stand. We need courage to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need a courage to be bold. We need, a courage, we need courage to be outspoken. Uh, we need courage to stand against the wiles of the devil that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6. We need all the courage we can get, especially in times like these, where, listen, everything that we say is not politically correct. Listen, everything we would say as a Christian, somebody else is going to say it's hate speech. Listen, the woke people out there don't want to like, they don't like anything we have to say because we speak the Word of God, and the Word of God has some judgment in it, and they don't want to hear that from us. You and I need to recognize that we need to be courageous during these days. Uh, We can't stick our head in the sand. We can't just hope somebody else will say it. You and I need to be courageous. Now, I get it. We need to be gracious to people and loving toward people, but we need courage as we stand in the faith. Um, This faith that you and I have, it's meant to be shared. It's meant to be shared with other people. And let me tell you, it takes courage sharing your faith with somebody else. It takes courage talking to somebody and saying, Hey, listen, have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you, do you go to church anywhere and they're like, well, no, I kind of, maybe as, as a kid I went. And you're like, well, listen, have you ever been born again? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? And then they're like, well, and they answer kind of vague. And that lets you know that you need to talk a little bit more. I mean, was there ever a time that you called on Jesus who died for you? He died for your sins. And you start sharing the gospel. You will need courage to do that. In fact, usually fear rises up in you and I and we don't say anything at all. That's kind of our posture today in the body of Christ. And I'm just telling you right now, if we're going to see a lot of people get saved in this world, it's going to be one-on-one evangelism. While events and crusades have their place, and Billy Graham's, I'm thankful for what he did and others, let me tell you something, one-on-one evangelism is where it's got to get to because you and I see a lot of people, people that we can't just hope go to some event sometime and hear some preacher from somewhere else. Or even that they would walk through these doors, although we invite people, that's certainly a good thing to do, invite people to come to church. They're like, well, surely Jason's going to share the gospel. I do, but they may never walk through these doors. You're going to need courage to share the gospel with other people. And here it is, Peter is saying that, he's saying that on this list of adding to our faith, he lists courage first, first. And if you look at that list, you could say, well, there's some other things that may seem more appealing. You know what I mean? It's kind of like me over in the produce aisle. I mean, why do we need this worthless lettuce, amen? We need to get to the cheeses, you know? 
so here it is. Why would we, how about we start somewhere else? No, listen. If you and I are going to add all these other things and be the witnesses, God grows us in the faith. Even the act of growing in the faith, being interested in the things of God, stepping out and following Him, we need more courage just to say we're all in. We need more courage just to step toward any of these other things. So here it is, Peter. He starts with courage. Now, we mentioned last week a person, first off, has to put their faith in Jesus Christ first. So that is paramount. You can't get the cart before the horse. A person must put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And once they have, listen, soon after, they need to be adding courage to their faith. Because guess what? Their family may not like it, especially the early church and what they were dealing with. Today, we're talking about Paris, France. Let me tell you, a person in Paris, France, gets saved today and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have been such a Muslim city, and Europe has been such a Muslim region that, let me tell you something, they, they don't want to hear that you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. A person that gets saved today, outside of the Bible Belt, they're going to face all kinds of heat in the kitchen. They're going to need courage, and you might need courage down here too. I don't know. But courage is important. And listen, God doesn't want you and I to wait till we have all these other things added to our faith for you and I to speak up and say something about the Lord Jesus Christ. A person that gets saved today in this service, if there was an 8-year-old, a 10-year-old, or an 80-year-old gets saved today in this service today, God is not waiting for them to grow a ton before He puts it on their heart to tell somebody else about Jesus. In fact, probably before the day's out, He's going to have them, the Holy Spirit's going to say, tell this other person you give your life to Jesus. Well, it's going to take courage to do that. We need to pray for God to add courage to our faith, our faith. Secondly, we move on. What else is Peter talking about here? Or what else is he sharing with us in this epistle here? He is saying that we need to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. So number two, we see knowledge, and we see that in verse number five. The knowledge that Peter's talking about is the word of God confirmed in your heart. Where you and I get in agreement with the word of God. Where you and I settle it that the Word of God is the Word of God, the Bible is the Word of God, Scripture is His God-breathed message to me and His instruction for me and His counsel for me and all the other things, that you and I quickly say, Lord, help me have knowledge. Help me pursue knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's got to be added to a person's faith. So a person gets saved and puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're hoping then that they would turn toward the Word of God and the Word of God would renew their mind. And they would begin getting this instruction and they would fall in love with the Word of God. That's what we're praying for and that's what a person needs to pursue. Lord, help me want to be in your Word. Now, spiritual addition, if we're talking about growing in the faith, which is the topic of this series, we could hope that we could do that some other way other than being in the Word of God. Listen, there are no shortcuts. No shortcuts. Word of God's got to be that important to us. Now, last night we went to uh, Cookful and we went to eat and uh, done a little shopping. You know what I mean? Went, done a little shopping. Uh, men, you got to take your wife shopping every now and then. This is counseling here, right here. You're not going to be in my office to talk about it, but you got to take your wife shopping a little bit. We go shopping a little bit, going to eat. And uh, but listen, we drive up Snows Hill and we get to the flashing light there at Kilgore's. Uh, we're not going to eat at Kilgore's. We might next week, but we're going to go somewhere. So we take a left, and we go Allen's Ferry Road, and we go around Smithville. You know that little bypass of a road. It's kind of a shortcut, if you will, to keep you from having to go through all of Smithville, which is not too big, but it's a shortcut. Glad for it. Uh, listen, I like all kinds of shortcuts. They help us. Hey, spiritually growing, there is no shortcut. I like to say, hey, listen, you can skip this. No, we can't. We're going to need the Word of God, not just today, but every single day for the rest of our lives. There is no shortcut. In fact, Romans 10, 17 talks about the importance of Word of God. There's faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the Word of God is important in helping bring us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, no doubt. Um, and this knowledge of God's Word, it's got to be added to our faith. Look at Romans 12, 2 on the screen, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you and I are going to grow spiritually, the Word of God is going to play a major, major role in our growth. And I would say right now, if you're saying, Brother Jason, my faith kind of does like this, and many people's faith, it does that, where we're, where we're growing and then we kind of go flat. We're growing, and then it just kind of, I don't know, kind of ho-hum. And we kind of, you know, try to muster up some 
whether it's commitment. And it's not about church attendance. A church that we're here every week. If you're here every week and you're like, still, my faith does this. It has to do with your relationship with the Word of God and mine. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of distractions today from you being in the Bible. A lot of distractions. But if you and I are going to grow spiritually, if we're going to have this knowledge added to our faith, the Word of God is going to play the all-important role in doing that. And so, so the question I've got for you today, maybe at the beginning, is have you made a commitment to reading God's Word? Is God's Word part of your life to the point where if you're not in God's Word, you know that, hey, wait, I've got to get my Bible. I need my Bible. I need to be reading. Do you miss God's Word when you're out of it? And the danger is that you and I would go for days or weeks and we would not miss it, that we would just kind of go along and go through the motions. And let me tell you something. I don't want to be, I'm not a prophet to say I think this is part of our issue of the body of Christ, that like 90% of us face this, but I would say this. Um, I grew up in Smithfield. I would say if I was a betting man, I'm not a betting man, I would say 90% of us probably have this issue. Where we're in the Word of God, out of the Word of God. In the Word of God, out of the Word of God. And because of that, this knowledge. Let me tell you something. When we're watching the news cycle happen like it's happening right now, you, you and I better have the Word of God as our foundation. We better have the Word of God in us deeply because that will help us interpret these events. It will help us see what's going on. It will help us understand why it's going on. Amen. And we'll say, this is why this is going on. This is why we can't do this or that. Or this is why we've got to pray for these people. This is why we've got to keep doing what we're doing. The Word of God is so important. So important to us for our spiritual growth. And here it is. He says, add your faith virtue, which is courage, and courage add knowledge, he says. Got to move on. Number three. This will be the fun one here, y'all. Self-control. Turn to your neighbor and say, I like this already. <laughs> Self-control. Amen. <laughs> we don't like this one. Look back at verse five and six. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add your faith virtue to virtue knowledge to knowledge self-control. Now, the King James Version uses the word temperate, which is self-control. That's what it means. Um, and, and listen, uh, we need to know how to respond and react to things. We need to uh, have self-control in all kinds of areas of our life. You name it, we need self-control. Um, some would say to be temperate is to be moderate. Some people talk about we should live a balanced life. I don't like that. To say that we should live a balanced life would put God in some kind of category where he's just one of five or six things that we keep in balance. Wrong. The thing needs to be tilted toward Jesus Christ heavily, amen? Everything else should pale in comparison to our walk with God and our attention toward the spiritual things. It should be so out of balance, focused on God more than anything else. Now, I get this. We, want to be, we can be so heavenly minded we're no earthly good. We always hear that. But let me tell you something. I think today we ought to err on the side of being very heavenly, heavenly minded, amen? And if we'll do that, listen, we'll, we'll have some self-control. And again, notice the order of this. We've got courage, now we're in the Word of God, and now we're talking about having self-control. Uh, the Word of God in helping us, certainly the Holy Spirit indwelling us, works with all these things and helps establish these things and, and teaches us, no doubt. But having the Word of God in our life at, a, at the right place helps us in terms of knowing self-control as well. Uh, it helps us know what to stay away from, the Word of God works with self-control to help us know what's in, what's out. Not a legalistic type thing or a dot and I's and cross and T's, but let me tell you something. There are things that do not belong in your life. There are things that do not belong in your family's life. There are things that you and I don't need to watch on a device. There are things you and I don't need to embrace in this life. And let me tell you something. If we're waiting for the culture to tell us that we shouldn't do it, we're, listen, that's a pipe dream. We need to be thinking the Word of God's going to help me know what's in and what's out and what I should embrace and what I should not embrace. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God are going to help us know how to walk in self-control. And listen, I don't know what all is Peter getting at here. I mean, how, how big or how small does this get? Um, here this uh, next week, I, I've got two chances next week to completely blow self-control out the window, okay? So this coming Saturday is my family's, the Taylor family reunion. It's the, they moved it off Sunday, praise the Lord. The Word of God had an effect on that. But so our, our family reunion is this Saturday, and there'll be everything to eat. I mean, every type of fried chicken. I don't know you could make it different ways, but there's going to be a lot of different fried chicken. There'll be different top, types of mashed potatoes you can eat. And my goodness, the pies that you can eat, all these things. Listen, a man's got to exhibit some self-control when he goes through the line, amen? 
How much to get, how much to not get, all those things. I mean, uh, listen, last night at Longhorn Steakhouse, I got the Parmesan crusted chicken. I got the 12 ounce. Nikki said, You should get the nine ounce. I showed no self control and got the 12 ounce. Is that, is that what Peter is talking about here? Is that what he's talking about? Maybe. Perhaps. I'd say it's in, I, listen, I'd say it's included. When we're talking about self control here, we're talking about in all kinds of different areas of our life. We need self-control. We need to have God help us understand what's too far to go, what we need to do, what's right, what's wrong, how much of this. And it's not just about moderation. I don't like that word, but, but Lord, help me know what things to be part of. And really, I think what it boils down to is priorities. You and I have the right priorities. It helps us in terms of self-control because our priorities will tell us, don't do this, we're going to do that, we're giving our time to this, not that. So people with time issues, time management issues, have self-control issues. They let everything else dictate their time. That's a self-control problem and a stewardship problem wrapped in one. You and I, we need to trust the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, help me have self-control in all these areas of my life. And, and what is the end goal? What is it that God's looking for? Is he looking for you and I to be robots or you and I to be perfect? Listen, he knows we're not going to be perfect. What he's looking for, though, is a life that will submit to him that will glorify him and we have a better chance of doing that when we exhibit self-control now uh, don't turn here but look at the screen i think i've got these on the screen galatians chapter 5 talks about the fruit of the spirit but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such there is no law so we have Paul there mentioning that to the church of Galatians. And, and any, any way you slice it, whether you hear Peter talk about it or we have the Apostle Paul saying that the Holy Spirit will develop this fruit of the Spirit in you. Uh, we bear that fruit. He develops that. We bear that fruit. Again, it comes down to you and I being willing to receive what God wants us to receive. So do you need any kind of help with self-control? I would say we all need God to help us in self-control. We need to have self-control added to us. Even if we exhibit some self-control, this is not something where we wake up one day and say, well, you know what, I'm good with everything, I don't need self-control anymore, I think I've got it. No, until the day you and I breathe our last, we're going to need God to help us in this area of self-control. But you say, I don't know why. Um, listen, when, when we have self-control, I believe it strengthens our walk with God. I believe it strengthens our walk with God when you and I exhibit self-control. It, 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 listen, it says that I'm not my own. I belong to the Lord. I've been bought with a price. I'm not just making decisions for myself. I'm asking God about things. And when we do that, we have a better chance of walking in self-control. Self-control helps us be consistent in our walk as well. Helps us be not all, all over the map. And I know we're in a social media age where we're friends with people online and we see things. You ever see someone that's quoting the Bible one minute and the next minute they're like, nearly cussing somebody out i'm like what is going on with this person it's lack of self-control it's inconsistency in their witness my goodness the lord needs a steady witness from us amen i mean if we've looked at him and we watched jesus what did we see in him we saw someone that certainly had self-control listen jesus had power under control he had it harnessed amen Jesus had all the power he would ever need to do anything he ever wanted to do, and we watched him have self-control. When they pulled on his beard and they slapped his face and they put a crown of thorns on his head, we watched him submit to the Father's will, exhibit self-control, and humble himself even to the point of death. That is self-control on display. We watched that in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need self-control. Self-control helps us walk in integrity. Uh, it's coupled with the knowledge of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God leading us. Self-control is something that helps us glorify God. It helps us not compromise when we have self-control. When we have a spiritual grid, a spiritual filter, if you will, of what we're willing to do or not do or what we can be part of or not be part of. And the Word of God has helped develop that spiritual grid in us. Self-control plays a major role in that. So Peter here is talking about a lifestyle of self-control that has a uh, high dependence on the Holy Spirit is what he's saying. It's what he's saying. So, all right, Brother Jason, how does that play out in my life? What are some ways that plays out? Um, when the waitress has messed up your order, 
and she's the same waitress you got last week. She messed it up then too. Be gracious, have self-control, and don't read her the right act. Amen. That's self-control. That's self-control. When that co-worker that drives you crazy and pushes all your buttons, and you just want to give them a piece of your mind every day, self-control means, you know what, it doesn't mean you can't say something, but self-control, you'll say the right thing, amen, at the right time, if you and I are exhibiting some self-control. Uh, we need to buy a vehicle, and self-control says, listen, the neighbor's got a vehicle that's, that's a, a $90,000 vehicle, and and self-control says, you need a vehicle, but you're not spending 90000 Self-control says, get this other one instead. You know what I mean? And self-control comes into play, and you and I listen, and we make a better stewardship choice. Um, self-control says, you don't need everything your neighbor has. Amen? The world needs to hear that today. Everybody's trying to ante up. We're in a housing market right now that's crazy. People are selling really good houses to go get another really good house. It's even, I'm like, I'm not sure why everybody, everybody's moving. Why is everybody moving? Maybe it's, they need it. Maybe they need it. Or maybe they want to keep up with the Joneses. Self-control would say, don't worry about what the Joneses are doing. Self-control says, I don't care if every other person you know drinks alcohol. You don't need it in your life. Don't partake of alcohol. Self-control will say something like that. Holy Spirit will say something like that. And he'll use self-control built up over time to help you say, no, no, I'm not doing that. No, that's not for me. I'm not doing that. Self-control. Do we have that? Or do we just cave in? Brother Jason, I'm not sure it's bad. I don't know if that's caving in. We'll talk later. I've got an email I can send to you. Amen. Self-control says, I'm going to live within my means. We need self-control in this world. Amen. You're like, Brother Jason, do you have another point? This is the last one. Amen. Self-control. We need it. I'll tell you another thing that I, listen, I worked in the automotive industry for 13 years and um, watched this play out. I was a counselor before I was a preacher. I would butt into, co listen, co-workers' lives to say, hey, listen, you're married. That's not your wife. Quit flirting with her at the lunch wagon every day. I do that. Listen, that's wonder I even lived through those years. Um, but let me tell you something. Self-control says God has provided me with, with a spouse I'm not going to have wandering eyes, and I'm not going to flirt with that person across the, the workspace from me. Self-control says, stay away from that person. Don't even indulge in that. Oh, today, everybody just thinks everything's fair game. No, not if they're a spirit-filled believer, and they're allowing the Holy Spirit to develop sp self-control in their lives more and more. Um, listen, la lack of self-control and flesh go hand in hand. Sorry, right, Brother Jason, we, we beat that horse, okay? We beat that horse. Let me tell you, I've been a pastor 25 years. Most of the counseling situations I get in, a lot of people have thrown self-control out the window and done something they regret. Don't let that be you. If you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit of God indwelling you. Peter here is saying that you need to add to this courage, knowledge, but then also add self-control. Peter's saying, he's saying that if you don't add it, it may not be there for you. That, that you, if you're going through the grocery store of life, spiritually speaking, he's saying, you better get it off the shelf. It's not in your basket. You better grab it. You better take self-control. You better have self-control developed. You better ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, I need some of that. Would you help develop self-control in me? And then the Holy Spirit perhaps could, if you skip the Word of God, He could say, yeah, I will, but you got to get in the Word of God. And you're like, oh, I feel conviction from that. Then you get in the Word of God. And then, then when the opportunity arises where you and I could cave in and compromise and do something that would kill our life, our marriage, or whatever it is, listen, all of a sudden then we'll exhibit self-control because the Word of God rises up in us and the Holy Spirit says, say no to that. And you, because you're in the Word of God, say, that's exactly right. I'm not doing that. And you walk away. Or if it's the alcohol situation, you get mocked. Who cares? Who cares? Let them mock you. You're not going to stand before them at the judgment seat. You're going to stand before Jesus. Amen. So am I. My goodness. I think that is one benefit of getting older is you care less about what people think. Can I get a witness? At the same time, we don't need to have no filters attached. We need to be courteous and gracious to people. I understand that. But I think the older you get as a Christian, or the more you mature as a Christian, the more you care about what God says instead of what everybody else says.
Let's add these things. Listen, the need for us to spiritually grow is real. Pursuing spiritual growth is worthwhile. Our witness in our pursuit of, of godliness depends on it. We've got to pursue it. Um, and my question to you today, will you add these things? Will you intentionally pursue adding courage, the knowledge of the Word of God, and self-control to your faith? Will you ask God, and maybe we're going to an invitation in just a moment, and that needs to be the ask, is where you say, God, would you help me add this to my faith? So the question's on the screen, what will you add to your faith? Will you add these things? Will you pursue these things? Will you? I, I don't know, listen, I don't know what's, listen, you, let's say you got saved and you've got it in your mind what you want God to do in your life. I get that. We've all got these ideas. Is he going to do all those things? I don't know. He might do some of those things. But I, so, so, so you've got a list of what you want God to do in your life, and he's got a list. Like me and Nikki, the Cheez-Its and the Little Debbies need to listen. She's got a good list. I got a bad list. The bad list needs to go. Hey, your bad list of whatever you're pursuing that's not of God, it needs to go. And you need to add these things, the right things. Take them off the shelf. They're available. God will develop these in you. And I'm not saying he hasn't. He probably has in and, and maybe some of you are saying he's developed all this in me. Great. Listen, there's more. We're going to keep talking in the weeks to come, but keep growing in your faith. Healthy things grow. Let's be healthy in the Lord, amen? And let's grow. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for how you desire for us so many great things that will help us um, spiritually, but also help us be a, a witness that we need to be. You've committed to helping us become more like Christ. Thank you for that. Lord, help us be interested in that. May we spiritually ask you to help add these things to our lives. May we be, lives, may we be interested in the things of God more and more. And Lord, we're worried about a revival happening in the country. We need a revival to happen in us first. Lord, it won't happen unless we pursue the things of God like Peter's talking about here. May this be our pursuit, in Jesus' name, amen.